Hi, welcome back to the second video of the Understanding LIBOR Transition Series. So in the first video, we have seen uh, the concepts of LIBOR, the problems it creates, and how it is being uh, replaced by RFR. Before we understand RFR again, which is uh, risk-free rates, let's try to do a quick recap about LIBOR. Now we have seen that LIBOR is based on a simple question uh, which is asked to all the major London banks. At what rate could you borrow funds? Were you to do so by asking for and then accepting interbank offers in a reasonable market size? So what happens? A panel of banks submit their rates. Now these are rates for loans which they might borrow. It's not that the transactions have actually happened. Now, once these submissions are done, the top and the bottom quartiles are discarded and an average calculated for the remainder. So in this example, 2.5 is the LIBOR rate. And we also saw in the earlier video, there's a matrix. Uh, so we have LIBOR USD, LIBOR Euro, LIBOR GBP, and we have rates for each of the maturities. So you can say that LIBOR rate for USD three months is 3% or a euro one week is 2% and so on. So as per this matrix, the LIBOR rate are published. So what are the problems uh, introduced by LIBOR? It is just a submission, so it's easy to manipulate by the member banks and which has happened in the past. So an excess of banks submit cheaper rates. So to get rid of this anomaly, risk-free rates have been introduced. And this LIBOR has been replaced for five major currencies, and each of them have their own risk-free rate names. So for example, the US, it is SOFR, Secured Overnight Financing Rate. UK, it is SONIA, Sterling Overnight Interbank Average Rate. For Easter, it's Euro Short Term Rate. Seron is for the Swiss, and Tunar is for the Tokyo or the JPIV currency. So each of them have been replaced, uh, have replaced the LIBOR. And there is a working group for each of these. This is the working group which gives the oversight and monitors and uh, governs these rates. And the administrator are there. It's usually the central bank of the respective region of the country. Finally, there is a last column called whether it is secured or no. And what we mean by secured, we will come to it in the next slide when we try to understand uh, what secured overnight financing rate is. So with SFR as an example, let's try to understand RFR or the risk-free rate. Before we go to uh, uh, RFR, we need to understand how repo works. Repo is nothing but a repurchase agreement because that is the key to understanding RFR. So let's assume that there are two banks, Bank A and Bank B in the US. Bank A is in tremendous shortage of funds. It needs desperately to cover over a crisis. It needs to get 1 million. So it has government securities, okay, T-bills. So it sells or pledges its security to Bank B. And Bank B is flush with funds. It gives Bank A or borrows Bank A 1 million USD. So actually Bank A has sold securities and got and sold it for 1 million. The promise Bank A says is that it's just for the day. Next day, I'm going to buy it back. And buy it back, it does. So the next day, the Bank A will buy back those securities. But this time, Bank B will sell it for a higher amount for 1.2. So isn't it the difference of 0.2 million? Isn't it the interest rate which Bank B charges because it has lent? Yes. So while this may look like a repurchase of securities, ultimately it is a loan. Bank B has given a loan to Bank A at an interest of 0.2 million, which may be translated to say 20%. And the whole transaction is very secure. Why? Because it has been pledged with securities. And that to which securities? It is government T-bills, US government treasury bills. So the transaction is absolutely secure. 
So this is the rate which will be known as the risk-free rate because there was virtually no risk of Bank B giving the loan to Bank A because government securities was pledged. So that's why it's known as um, SOFR, where is it is secured, it is overnight because the loan was overnight, financing rate, Bank B was financing Bank A, and obviously there is a rate involved in this transaction. So hope with this repo example, you understood what SAFR stands for and why it is so named. So let's just uh, word it out. SOFR uses the actual cost of transactions. So like the example in the previous slide, there would be lots of transactions in the overnight repo market and the calculation is done by the New York Federal Reserve. So the US government bonds serve as a collateral in the borrowing and the rate is published at approximately 8 a.m. the next day. So if the transaction has happened on Monday, Tuesday 8 a.m., this rate is now published for the broader forum. How it is applied in an actual context of a borrowing. So in the case of a LIBOR, in the case of LIBOR, let's talk about LIBOR here. At the beginning of the loan, the interest rate is fixed. Let's say it's 5%. So it is forward looking in the sense that 5% never changes. And on Jan 1st, I know that Jan 31st, because of interest rate of 5%, my interest is going to be, let's say, 5,000. Similarly, on Jan 31st, the interest rate of LIBOR is reset. It could be 6%. And the interest I know immediately is 6K. So in the beginning of the interest period, both the borrower and lender knows what's going to be my cash inflow and outflow because the rate is fixed for the period. So the interest rate is decided in advance. It is decided in advance. So that's why we say LIBOR as forward looking rate. Now let's take the same example of SAFR or the risk free rate. Now in this case, because these are based on real transactions which have happened overnight, so the rate is decided every day. So here it is decided it's 5%. The next day I will put 5.1. The next maybe it is 4.9. And these rates will be published by the federal, NY federal based on the previous night's repo transactions and so on. So only a uh, day before you come to know that the interest is going to be, let's say, 4K. So that is why this interest is always backward looking. At any point of time, I will not know what's going to be my exact interest schedule. So that's a tremendous drawback and there have been ways using look back, lockout, using term rates, how SOFR solves this problem. But practically, this is the way SOFR is applied. The key differences, we have seen that LIBOR is based on bank submissions, whereas RFR are actually based on transactions which have happened in the repo market of the US, in the case of SOFR. It's forward looking, which means it is decided in advance. Because it is based on overnight transactions, it is backward looking. It is completely unsecured. These are just submissions. No transactions have happened place. Whereas in RFR, we actually had a transaction which was backed by government securities. So there is very, very less chance of the rate being manipulated. We saw LIBOR has got several maturities like one week, two week, three months, six months. RFR is just a rate. It has no separate maturities. In the next video, we'll go into more complications. We'll look at uh, certain key terms like look back, lockout, uh, how the uh, backward looking uh, rate issue is solved using term rates. We'll look at observation shift without observation shift. And of course, the most important one, the compounding aspect of SAFR. Thank you.